Let's talk. John Brown. Churchill's Citadel is a major new history of Churchill in the 1930s, showing how his meetings at Chartwell, his country home, strengthened his fight against the Nazis. It is a fascinating new book by Catherine Carter. I'm delighted to say that Catherine joins us live on the line now. Catherine, good morning to you. Good morning. Hi. Just good to have you with us. We seem to think that Churchill sort of sprung, fully formed in his determination at the outbreak of, uh, of the Second World War, uh, you know, with his loathing of the Nazis and, and, if you like, his game plan of how to, uh, to get Great Britain to stand firm. But, of course, he must have plotted this somewhere. He must have had realisations. And though we may think Chequers it is, in fact, another house that has a crucial part in his development. His country home at Chartwell is the place that deserves centre stage in terms of him preparing for the wartime leadership that awaited him in 1940. And my book, Churchill's Citadel, charts the meetings that were happening behind the closed doors of his country home that ultimately informed his understanding of what was going on in Germany and therefore the position he took against the Nazis. Those who don't know, where that is, is Chartwell, by the way? Chartwell is in Kent. Mm -hmm. It's in the northern part of Kent. Um, and he lived there from, well, he bought it in 1922, spent two years completely renovating it and then lived there from 24 until he passed away in 65. So it's his main home for the latter half of his life. And so basically it's, it's his home base from which he can, you know, he can, he can sally forth and it's all presumably a place of refuge as well, uh, in those, in those run ups, the pre war years, which we're going to look at now, but also in the, in the tumultuous days after, after the, after the war and his, and his, uh, his interesting sort of post war career. It is the place that he held more dear to his heart than anywhere else in the world. There's a, a wonderful quote of his which says, a day away from Chartwell is a day wasted. Uh, um, one which I think is very, very true. And it certainly was the place where, away from the prying eyes of Westminster and London, he could have these meetings in the comfort of his own home, on his home turf, if you will. And to his home, he was bringing military figures, diplomats, politicians, scientists, the people he needed to build this knowledge arsenal if you will of what was going on in germany at the time of course he's you know in the 30s he's he's not he's looked at as, as, as a periphery figure i mean we now look back and think the great man i mean people who don't understand churchill's right you know the the the, the bell the bell uh, arc that is his life think that he was always put on a pedestal but you know during the 30s he's seen as as a peripheral figure as something of, of an and i use the word advisor of an, as an extremist if you like in the 1930s, he is on the back benches of Westminster. Um, he had been Chancellor of the Exchequer in the late 20s. And for a lot of people by the 30s, they probably thought that was the highest his career would ever achieve. You know, there were people who thought he was a spent force in politics and he, you know, was, wasn't going to be in that level of power or influence again. So that's where he's on the 30s. He's on the back benches. He'd love to be in back in government, but elections keep happening and he's never brought back. So everything he's doing in the 30s, he's doing from the position of lesser influence in Westminster. Well, why, is, why does Churchill's antenna go off? Then to what's happening over in Germany, because if you look at, say, 19, you know, the early 1930s, Germany is seen, Nazi Germany or National Socialist Germany is seen as a progressive place. You have these wonderful work programs that are building these autobahns. You've got the airships going up, which are the, if you like, the symbol of, 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 of superiority in the air. They're a modernist nation. They have motor racing cars. They're sitting land speed records. It seems like the, the, they are a progressive nation and they, they have rebuilt themselves and, and we are sort of, we are embracing our, our German colleagues. And, and yet, Churchill's got this, this distrust. Why is, why is his antenna wiggling? Winston Churchill makes a trip to Germany in the summer of 1932. And the reason he does this is because he is researching a biography he's writing of his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough, which turns out to be a million word, you know, four volume history that takes most of the 30s to write. Does it have, does it have Blenheim in it now and again, just, just slightly? And, yeah, just <laughs> once or twice. Um, and so he goes to do this research trip. And whilst he's out there, he 
is seeing what he describes shortly after this trip as a war mentality. And at this point, Hitler isn't actually chancellor yet in late 1932, but you do have the Nazis growing rapidly in terms of their support. And he makes a speech in November 1932 saying there will be another conflict with Germany if steps aren't taken immediately, which, as you say, is totally against the prevailing consensus. And and not only uh, is it because of the reasons you just said, but also the First World War is recent memory at that point. And there are thousands of people who can't stomach the idea of any other war and will do everything they can to avoid it. Because, obviously, we now look back at that knowing that the Second World War is an entirely different war to the First World War, mainly for several reasons, technology, air, you know, the air war, etc. But for anybody who has who's living in the 20s or early 30s, they just assume that the next war that comes, if there is going to be a war, will be... The First World War, but on an even more horrific scale. You're absolutely right. It is definitely the case that with the advances in technology, the assumption is that another war will see catastrophic global impacts um, with likely targets of civilians as well, which isn't seen in the First World War. The assumption is that another future war will involve that and much greater use of war in the air, as you say. So Winston Churchill, in trying to sound the alarm that the Nazis are preparing for war and therefore Britain should be doing the same, is doing so in a climate where people just can't bear the thought because the assumption is that it will be apocalyptic if mm. war breaks out again. What? Why did... How does Churchill then, who is this backbench figure, manage to attract this quite incredible cast of people to come visit us? I mean, the the the, the, the visitors log at, at Chartwell must look absolutely magnificent. I mean, talk about talk about a snapshot of who was where in the in the thirties. But because if he's a peripheral figure, I mean, that's that. I can't see many sort of backbenches in the UK uh, having those sort of people coming to a a politician who'd want to speak to such a wide range to get all this this coming in. But also, people would say, "Well, I'm I'm very sorry, Winston, but I'm very you know I'm busy that day, and I might and I might I might go yachting that weekend." So why are they coming to him? By being among the first to take an official position against Adolf Hitler and against the Nazis, he then becomes someone around who those who are also in opposition can rally. But that has to be done away from Westminster because there is so much determination to avoid future war. So Churchill's house almost becomes his own personal branch of the Foreign Office out in rural Kent, where he has the likes of Albert Einstein, who has by that point fled Germany, fled German persecution, and is coming to Winston Churchill's home because he is one of the few figures in Britain at that point who is voicing opposition to Hitler. And it is this drawer of phenomenal individuals. You've got the former French Prime Minister, you've got the former German Chancellor, all these people with access to intelligence and information who can then bring that to Winston Churchill to his front door, but also those who witnessed persecution and terror playing out in Germany as well. You've got people who are, you know, victims of the Night of the Long Knives in terms of those who were attempted to be assassinated, then coming to Winston Churchill's house to say what happened that night. So he's got this really rich tapestry developing at Chartwell of intelligence and people's recollections. So hang on, you, you've got Night of the Long Knives is where mm -hmm. Hitler gets rid of Sturm and all those guys, is it ever correct? Yeah. So they are members yes. of the SA who basically are, are you know, his, his thugs from the first thing, before, from the from the minute beer push. So he's got former members of the Nazi party basically coming to speak, see him in his house in Chartwell, or not? Am I, I, no, no, sorry, no, 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 sorry, I've, 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 I've perhaps misrepresented that. No, it was someone who was, someone oh. who was Fleeing right. from the yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, My mind was just no. completely blown from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so a, a gentleman who was um, transport secretary in one of the uh, last cabinets of the Weimar government right. was a target on the Night of the Long Knives. And he is then brought by Germany's former chancellor to Winston Churchill's house. And this man, his recollections of that day are astonishing. He's actually in his tennis kit playing tennis at home when German troops, you know, Nazi troops turn up at his door to assassinate him. And he manages to evade capture, flee, come to Britain and meet Winston Churchill. So these are the astonishing meetings that, in my opinion, are I, I can't understand why they're not more well known. So I'm really excited to be able to share them well, in this well, book. This is the thing because we, you know, I mean, and... Uh, 
And I don't mean to drag him into 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 the 21st century because Winston is, is Churchill is Churchill, a, a magnificent leader. But they, people get him wrong on on the level that they think he he was, as I said before, sprung fully formed with this opinion, and basically was saying, you know, came up with fighting on the beaches and all that sort of stuff. He was an incredibly complex figure. And he listens to people. So rather than people go, oh, well, the reason we should have our borders shut is because that's what Churchill would have done. Well, perhaps he wouldn't have because he had the, in, he had the, 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 the political nous to, to speak to a whole section of, of world society without having a prejudice. And from that information, he was able to form what would come to be sort of his, his policies, his, uh, and the way that he looked in the world, which when the rest of the, of the, of the, of the world was saying, you know, we must appease Hitler. It's not so bad. We can do a deal with them. The testimonies and the, the evidence that he had, he had got, he had gathered from the, these years and that allowed him to, if you like, to see the truth. In, in, in Bonswick, he had done his research. He was someone who would have gut instincts, but wouldn't rely solely on that for something as important as, as this, because he really was having to fight against such an overwhelming sense of the desire to avoid war. So in order to have clout in terms of the speeches and the articles he was writing, he had to, to back it up, essentially, with with data, with first-hand accounts of what was going on. If he was just saying, I've got a bad feeling, mm. people aren't going to listen to that. You know, So he is methodical in his approach to gleaning as much information as he can to support his arguments. And then as the 30s wear on, and unfortunately you see the Nazi party's uh, horrible process of kind of foreign policy aggression playing out from the remilitarization of the Rhineland to Austria to Sudetenland, you see this sort of uh, ripple effect. And But he sees this much earlier. He says the Nazis are planning this and you know what? You're all falling for it. They are doing it step by step. They've got this all planned out and we're giving them everything they want. And it is quite astonishing that even in 1939, there there's a considerable constituency in Westminster who still don't want to give him a seat at the table, even then. Mm, yeah, because he's, he's kind of you know, he's been a, he's been a former first lord of the Admiralty. He's been he's been you know he's he's put down also that during the general strike he's not exactly endeared himself to certain parts of the country. Um, presumably, this time it's also a family home, and he's got. He's got family there. He's got daughters. I mean, they are presumably young adults rather than than sort of being ankle biters. But so, what's it like as a, as a house? Because we can say Chartwell, a Citadel, and the whole thing. But it's it's a family house at the same time. I'm not saying it's a two up, two down. But what's the actual what's the actual house like itself? Well, what I've done in Churchill Citadel is try and balance that high politics and diplomacy with everyday life, family life, domesticity. So at the same time, example, you've got these incredible meetings happening. You've got one of his daughters eloping, running away with someone that, you know, she knows that mummy and daddy don't approve of. You've got things oh. like the chauffeur quitting because he's doing too many late nights. There's so many lovely little angles of everyday life balanced alongside. Can I just ask, imagine eloping with Winston Churchill's daughter and then coming back and having to face Winston. Well, do you know what, actually? this So Winston had met this gentleman before. Sarah Churchill, who's the Churchill's third child, yeah. she is a, a dancer. And in one of her earliest productions, she meets a man called Vic Oliver, who is much older and divorced. Sarah brings him home to meet Papa at Chartwell. Doesn't go well. And but she plays it very coolly. She says, do you know what? I can see that he's probably not right for me. And she puts on a brilliant act and then waits until her little sister's birthday and runs off to New York to marry this man. So you've got and that's just one sort of strand of family drama that's happening at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely not a quiet house at Chartwell. <laughs> so how did you how did you. What gave you the spark to to put this this particular book together, and where do you get the information from? Because again, I knew I know of Chartwell, but I certainly didn't know everybody from Einstein to 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 uh, T. S. Uh, to, to Lawrence, for example, Lawrence, you know Lawrence of Arabia. Well, in my day job, I am the curator of Chartwell, oh, well, okay. and. Uh, <laughs> And in, it's uh, although this book has been written um, in my spare time, so evenings, weekends and holidays for four years has gone into creating Churchill Citadel. And so there is a visitor's book at Chartwell, which is a really good starting point. But that tended to only list the overnight guests. So it gives some of the people there, but not all. So my research involved archives 
all over the world, um, correspondences to and from Winston Churchill, um, his engagement cards, you know, Clementine's diaries, their daughter's diary, and sort of creating this wealth of information from which I could then draw out these meetings. And there are some absolutely brilliant ones in there. You know, you've got JFK's dad coming in 1935. Mm, he was an interesting character, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, so Joseph P. Kennedy, he went on to become the American ambassador in London. Yeah, so he visits in 1935. And it's a really interesting time because it's not long after the Anglo-German naval agreement has been signed, which seems astonishing now, but we made a naval agreement with Germany at that point. Mm. Um, and Churchill is looking, as you say, having been First Lord of the Admiralty in the past, at creating some sort of Anglo-American share naval police force is his sort of idea and that's what he's pitching to Joe Kennedy um, unfortunately that meeting doesn't go well Kennedy doesn't take to Churchill at all and um, says you know I don't trust him and so that's actually an example of a meeting that doesn't go Churchill's way because if every one of these meetings went Churchill's way then he would have come to power or influence much earlier I mean Kennedy's got a backstory anyway Kennedy has you know his 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 view of the world is is opposed to to, to Churchill so he's very much you know he, he's very much on uh, if you like on the other camp which makes him a very sort of which shows which shows where America is where their and, and this was used in their America first policy don't get involved with stuff over there it's, it doesn't affect on a nation coming out of a great depression for example and only just getting the uh, FDR's uh, New Deal right up and running they, 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 they don't want to be involved in European things and stuff happening over there it, it's seen as the old empire you know we're America we've got to deal with our, with our problems first you're absolutely right that the, um, the isolationist policies of the United States do make it an uphill struggle to try and engage the United States in the likelihood of conflict playing out in Europe and one of the moments in my book that is not very well known at all is a speech that Churchill broadcasts to NBC in the summer of 1939. So within weeks of war breaking out and still a backbench MP at that point, but doing his bit even then, weeks away from war being declared to desperately try and persuade the American people to ready themselves to support um, Britain and her allies. This, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you see what happens, the, the relationship that he has with with America, he loves America. I mean, I, you know, I've read books about his his you know his meals at the White House and the and the dinner menus are outstanding. Um, and, but it's it's really funny to, to think of of, of 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 them not being sort of not having that special relationship at the time. What do you what, what's your what's your favourite? Because I mean, you, you you're walking around there, and and you must. You must feel sort of the the, the 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 walls must sort of now and again spook you in a, in a good way, you know. The echo because when you write about these situations, and you know, James Holland calls it walking the ground. You know, when mm -hmm. you're actually saying because living history, and I I can I do that over here in Spain because I'm surrounded by history here as well. It must bring what you're writing so much to life because you look at you must look out over the lawn and think that's where that's where Einstein did did, I, did a Ford roll or something like that, you know. <laughs> I think the fact that I have been inadvertently walking the ground for 10 years <laughs> definitely has, has helped the book. And I think that there's something I can bring to it uh, in the sense that because I'm so imbibed with the place, I can even, you know, know how the light falls on a late summer afternoon in the garden, you know, and how the building creaks and you know all those sorts of things just to make you have a real sense of what life is like there but as well I mean some of my favourite stories are things like um, the secretaries and their recollections of life there so I've tried to balance the staff perspective as well because their world's orbited around Chartwell almost as much as the Churchill. So it's a, it's a really rich variety of, of different stories and anecdotes. And who, you know, somebody who's going to prepare his mouthwash, as he used to call it, you know, that, 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 uh, cause people think he drank neat whiskey all day and that's why he always fell over. But he drank, didn't they? they called it mouthwash because it was, it was literally sort of 15 parts water to a tiny bit of whiskey so he could have it through the day. That's that's it. If you imagine you've got a glass and you are putting just enough whiskey that there is a thin film at the very bottom of the glass and then and then it's water on top. So uh, it's definitely not the case he was having neat whiskey all day. I can confirm. Marvellous. What, what are you hoping that people will take from uh, from uh, Churchill Citadel? For me, I think that there is a, a prevailing belief that Chartwell was this sort of quiet, idyllic retreat with beautiful views. And, and it was a beautiful place, but to imagine that it was 
just where he would go to relax is completely missing the international significance of Chartwell. The fact that it was his factory of words, you know, in terms of his writing, he wrote more than William Shakespeare and Charles Dickens combined. And most of that in the study at Chartwell until two in the morning, three in the morning. And then, of course, these meetings happening to arm him with information around Germany preparing for war. So I want to counter that belief that Chartwell was just a scenic backdrop to Winston Churchill. For me, it is centre stage. Presumably he would have been quite sort of put out to have to go to Chequers in that case, because it's, you know, it's he got to yump the other side of the country, or was he, because people say, oh, well, Chequers was the, was the, was, he's always been the Prime Minister's stronghold, but, but he must have been a quite, because you don't, you don't kind of know Chequers, it's, it's like, it's like beginning to a travel lodge, isn't it, basically, you kind of know where it is, but you know, it's not exactly homely. Well, so Chequers and Chequers and Ditchley uh, were both places he went when he was prime minister and Chequers as his official residence. But in the 1930s, Chequers was not somewhere he had access to. But I'm sure he would have loved to have been back at Chartwell more during the war. But unfortunately, it was well known that Chartwell was going to be a target for the German Air Force. Um, They had this document called the Black Book, which listed essentially the places upon the successful invasion of Britain where they were going to make a beeline to. um, And Chartwell was pretty much top of the list. So they knew that it would be incredibly risky for Churchill to be there. But Brilliantly, he he had a plan to make it so that they could never find his house, and they never did. What do you put, put it on rollers or something and move it around a lot? <laughs> <laughs> no, Char- Charwell has two very big lakes. And if you are flying over at night, bodies of water are what you're looking out for. So he had the lakes covered in leaves. And so they knew that they were looking for a house with a T-shaped house with two lakes. But alas, they found a T-shaped house, no lakes, can't be Churchill's house. Brilliant. Um, if people want to find out more about you or about the book, where's the best place to find you? So uh, I am on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, and my handle is at Katie Culture. So K-A-T-I-E Culture. Uh, otherwise, uh, to buy a copy of Churchill Citadel would be my recommendation, which is out uh, later this month. And you'll be able to order it via our own virtual bookstore. And just quickly, because you are at Chartwell, so people can visit, can't they? they can, it's, 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 it's open to the public, etc.? Chartwell is indeed open to public. It's open year round. The house itself is open from uh, February to November, but then does Christmas opening as well. Um, but the gardens are spectacular and those views that Churchill fell in love with are worth it for a visit on their own. So, uh, yes, you can come anytime and see Churchill's home. And a final question. What does the light look like falling on a, on a summer evening across the, and looking out the same thing as, the, as, as Churchill did? Well, what's brilliant is that view is unchanged. There's been no development within that view that he fell in love with. And my gosh, on a sunny summer's evening, you've got these glorious long shadows reaching down towards the lake as the light starts to turn warm. And it's just the most beautiful sight. The book is called Churchill Citadel. It's Chartwell and the Gatherings Before the Storm. It is by Catherine Carter, who is speaking today. You can order it via our own virtual bookstore, Catherine. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Giles.